Representation theory of finite groups, lecture seven, characters. This lecture starts the second part of the course, which is mainly devoted to the theory of group characters. Let us start with a rough motivation for this theory. Let G be a finite group and V be a finite dimensional G module. Let us fix a basis in V, denoted by bold V, consisting of the vectors V1, V2, and so on, Vk. So in particular, V has dimension k. Each element of the group G acts on V as a linear operator. In our fixed basis, this action can be represented by a k times k matrix with complex coefficients. In other words, if you want to describe the whole G module structure on V, the structure can be described using the cardinality of V times K square complex numbers. It is natural to ask the following question. Can we describe the same information using less amount of data? And in this part of the course, we will develop a theory which will allow us to describe roughly the same amount of information. So to determine our module V uniquely up to isomorphism using at most the cardinality of G complex numbers. So this is a very significant reduction in the amount of data we need to uniquely identify a G module V. So before we can define what a group character is, let us do a quick recap about the notion of the trace of a linear operator. Let A be a k times k matrix with complex coefficients. The trace of A is defined as the sum of the diagonal entries in the matrix A. And the main property of the trace is the fact that the trace of the product of two matrices does not depend on the order in which we take this product. So the trace of A beam is equal to the trace of BA for any two k times k matrices A and B. A consequence of this property is that the trace of the matrix S inverse AS is equal to the trace of the matrix A for any two k times k matrices A and S such that S is invertible. In order to see this, we apply the main property of the trains to the pair S inverse A and S. So if you multiply them in one direction, we get S inverse AS, and in the other direction, we get S times S inverse A, which is exactly A. Now, let V be a vector space with a fixed basis V1, V2, and so on VK, which we denote by bold little v. Let F be a linear map from V to V. Then, with respect to our basis V, we have the matrix of this linear map, which is a k times k matrix with complex coefficients. And the trace of the linear operator F is defined as the trace of this matrix. Of course, there is a choice involved. The matrix depends on the choice of the basis, but because of the previous discussion and due to the base change formula, so the matrix of the linear operator F in a different basis has the form S inverse, the matrix of the linear F in the original basis S, where S is the transformation matrix between the two bases. So due to the properties of the trace, the trace doesn't really depend on the choice of the basis. Now we can make our main definition. Let G be a finite group and V a finite dimensional G module. Then for each element G in G, we have the corresponding linear operator of the action of this element little g on V. So we define the character of V as the function whose domain is our group G and whose codomain is the set of all complex numbers. And the value of this function, denoted chi v, 
at the element little g in the group g is defined as a trace of the linear operator of the action of g on v. To be able to effectively compute such a trace, we need to choose some basis, little bold v, in our module v, and then chi v evaluated at g is equal to the trace of the matrix of the linear operator of the action of g on v in this basis, little bold v. Here are some easy examples. Example 1. Assume that the dimension of v is equal to 1. Then the value of the character of v at an element g coincides with the unique entry of the 1 times 1 matrix, which describes the action of g on v. In other words, for the one-dimensional g module v, the character is exactly the same information as the module structure. Example 2. Consider the left regular module CG. So this module has a standard basis consisting of the elements in G. So if we have two elements in G, G and H, such that the element little g is not the identity element, then G times H is not equal to H. This observation tells us that in the case when G is not the identity element, all diagonal elements in the matrix describing the action of G on the regular module in the standard basis are zero. Of course, if we consider the identity element, then its action is represented by the identity matrix, and so each diagonal element of this matrix is one. So consequently, the character of the regular representation of G is the following function. So the value of this character at the identity element is the cardinality of G. This is a dimension of CG. And the value of this function at any non-identity element of the group is zero. Here is a little bit more complicated example, example three. Let us consider the natural SN module, which we for the moment denote by capital N. This module has a standard basis which consists of the elements 1, 2, 3, and so on, all the way up to n. For a permutation sigma in Sn, the element sigma of j, where j is a basis element in our module, is an element of the standard basis. So this means that the corresponding column sigma of j has 1 on the diagonal if and only if sigma of j is equal to j. Otherwise, the corresponding diagonal element is zero. So this means that the value of the character of this module at the element sigma coincides with the cardinality of the set of all elements between one and k, which are fixed by sigma. So this is a number of fixed points of the permutation sigma. The character of the natural SN module is given by the number of fixed points of a given permutation. Let us now discuss some basic properties of characters. Basic property number one, for any G module V, the value of the character of V at the identity element equals the dimension of V. Proof. We know that the identity element acts on V as the identity linear operator. The matrix of the identity linear operator in any basis is the identity matrix of the size given by the dimension of the vector space V. So the trace of the identity matrix is the dimension of the vector space V. Basic property two, for V and W in G mode, if V and W are isomorphic, then the characters of V and W coincide. Let phi from V to W be a fixed isomorphism of G modules. Then, for any element small g in G, the action of G on W is described by the linear operator, which is given as the composition of phi inverse, followed by the linear operator describing the action of G on the module V, and then followed by phi. So therefore, the trace of the action of G on W 
is equal to the trace of the linear operator 5 inverse followed by g acting on v followed by phi. And due to our properties of the trace, this is equal to the trace of the action of G on V. So this means that the value of the W character at G is equal to the value of the V character at G. Let us go on with further basic properties. Basic property three, if G and H are conjugate elements in our group, then the value of the character of V at G and H coincide. Proof, let A be an element in G which conjugates H to G. In other words, such that little g is equal to A, H, A inverse. So then, because of the group axioms, the action of G on V is the composition of the action of A inverse on V followed by the action of H on V, followed by the action of A on V. Due to the action axiom, the action of A inverse on V is equal to the action of A on V and then taken inverse. Therefore, the trace of the action of G on V is equal to the trace of this composition and due to the properties of the trace, this is equal to the trace of the action of H on V. And hence, the value of the character of V on G is equal to the value of the character of V on H. Basic property four, for any element G in G, we have that the value of the character of the direct sum V and W at G is equal to the sum of the values of the character of V at G and the value of the character of W at G. Proof. Let us choose a basis in the direct sum of V and W, which is compatible with this direct sum decomposition. So this means that in this basis, any element G in G is represented by the following block diagonal matrix. So the action of G on the direct sum in this basis is is given by the following block diagonal matrix, where we have the north-west block describing the action of G on V, and the south-east diagonal block describing the action of G on W, and the off-diagonal blocks are zero. So therefore, the trace of the linear operator of G on the direct sum of V and W is the sum of the traces of the action of G on V and W, respectively. Let us now talk about the character of the tensor product. Basic property five, for any element G in G, the value of the character of the tensor product of V and W at G is the product of the values of the character of V at G and the character of W at G. Proof. So let us fix G in our group. And recall that the action of G on any module is diagonalizable. This is because the cardinality of G power of the element little g is equal to the identity. And so the element G is annihilated by the polynomial x to the power of the cardinality of G minus 1. And this polynomial does not have multiple roots. So if a linear operator is annihilated by a polynomial without multiple roots, it is diagonalizable. So we can choose an eigenbasis VI for G acting on V and let lambda I be the corresponding eigenvalues. And we can choose an eigenbasis WJ for the action of G on W and let mu J be the corresponding eigenvalues. In this case, the elements VI tensor WJ, here VI runs through the eigenbasis of G on V, and WJ runs through the whole eigenbasis of G on W. So such elements, they form an eigenbasis for the action of G on the tensor product, 
and the corresponding eigenvalues are exactly lambda i times mu j. So in particular, the trace of the action of g on the tensor product is the sum over all i and j of the products lambda i times mu j. We can rewrite the sum as a product where the first factor is a sum over all i of lambda i's and the second factor is a sum over all j of mu j's. And this is exactly the product of the trace of the action of g on v and the trace of the action of g on w, which proves our basic property. Let us look at some further examples. Consider the natural representation capital N of Sn. So we know that this natural representation decomposes into the direct sum of the trivial Sn module, C triv, and a simple Sn module, which we previously denoted by Un, which has dimension n minus 1. So this simple module of dimension n minus 1 is usually denoted by the curly S with the upper index n minus 1, comma 1. This notation will be explained in details in the third part of this course. So let us try to determine the character of this simple module, curly S, with the index n minus 1, comma 1. We know that the character of the trivial module is a constant function whose value is the complex number 1. And this is a value at each element in our group. And we also have already seen what is the character of the natural representation. The value of the character of the natural representation at an element sigma is given by the number of fixed points of sigma. Since n is a direct sum of the trivial module and the module s n minus 1, 1, the character of the natural module is the sum of the characters of the trivial module and the character of the simple module which we want to determine. So we can move the character of the trivial module to the left-hand side and get that the character of s n minus 1, 1 is a difference between the character of the natural module and the character of the trivial module. So the value of the character of s n minus 1, 1 at sigma is equal to the number of fixed points of sigma minus 1. To develop the theory further, it is actually quite useful to understand where group characters live. So consider the set FGC of all functions from G to C. So since C is a vector space over C, this set, if you take all functions from any C into a vector space, this is naturally a vector space with respect to pointwise operations. So this set, FGC, has a natural structure of a vector space under the pointwise operations. If we have two functions alpha and beta, then their sum is defined as the function whose value at g is equal to the sum of the values alpha at g and beta at g. And similarly, if we have a function alpha and a complex number lambda, then the value of lambda alpha at g is equal to lambda times alpha of g. So we have the vector space of all functions from the group g to c. In this vector space, we can consider the subset denoted by cf from g to c of all functions that are constant on conjugacy classes. So in other words, an element alpha is in CFGC if and only if the value of alpha at FGF inverse is equal to the value of alpha at G for all elements F and G in our group G. And the elements of the set are usually called class functions. So these are functions which are constant on conjugacy classes. It is very easy to check that the set of all class functions is a subspace of the set of all functions. Further, the space of all functions has a natural basis given by the Kronecker functions delta g, indexed by elements little g in our group capital G, 
So such a function has value one at the element little g and has value zero at all other elements. So in particular, the dimension of the space of all functions is equal to the cardinality of g. And due to basic properties of characters, we know that the character of any g module v belongs to the subspace of class functions. One can organize characters of simple modules of a finite group into what is known as a character table. So let g be a finite group and let v1, v2, and so on vk be a complete and irredundant list of representatives of simple g modules. We know that there are finitely many simple g modules. Let C1, C2, and so on Cm be a list of conjugacy classes of G. Definition, the character table of G is a matrix which has K rows and M columns. Here, rows are indexed by our simple modules, Vi, and columns are indexed by conjugacy classes by the CJs. And the element in this intersection of the row indexed by VI with the column indexed by CJ is equal to the number, which is the value of the character of VI at some element G in CJ. So this is well defined because characters are constant in conjugacy classes. Later on, we will show actually that k is equal to m, so the number of simple modules for g is equal to the number of conjugacy classes. But we don't know it right now, so for now it's just some matrix. Later on we will see that this is actually a square matrix. And we will now do many examples where we will see that this is a square matrix. So here are some easy examples. So if we take the group consisting of one element, it, of course, has only one conjugacy class, and it has only one simple module, namely the trivial module. So the character table of the group is a 1 times 1 matrix, which consists of the element 1. Example 2. Consider the unique up to isomorphism to element group Z2. So this is a group of um, residues modulo 2 with respect to addition. So this group is commutative, and so each element is its own conjugacy class. So we have two conjugacy classes, one consisting of the element zero, this is the identity element in the group, and one consisting of the element one. And we have two simple modules, the trivial module, both zero and one act as the identity, and the sign module. So here zero acts as the identity and the element one, acts as minus one, it changes the sign. So the character table of this group is as follows. So both simple modules are one dimensional and for one dimensional modules, the module structure is exactly the character. So we have a two times two matrix where the first row is one one, so this is a character of the trivial module and the second row is one minus one. This is a character of the sign module. Let us now discuss a more complicated example. Let us determine the character for the symmetric group S3. So we consider the group S3, which has six elements, the identity E, and then we take S to be the transposition of one and two, and T to be the transposition of two and three. And then the elements of S3 are E, S, T, ST, TS, and the element W0, which can be written as a product STS and as a product TST. The conjugacy classes in S3 are the following subsets, the identity, and then we have S, T, and W0. So if you start with S and conjugate by T, we get exactly W0. And if you start with W0 and conjugate by S, we get the element T back. So we have the conjugacy class ST and W0, and we have the conjugacy class consisting of ST and TS. You take any of these elements and conjugate but by either S or T, you get the other one. So we have three conjugacy classes. 
And we know that we have three simple S3 modules, the trivial module, the sign module, so these are the two one-dimensional modules, and the module curly S 2,1. This is this direct summand of the natural module, which we just discussed. And we computed that the character of the module curly S 2,1 is given by the number of fixed points of the permutation minus one. So therefore, the character table of a stream is as follows. So we have three columns and three rows. For the trivial module, the character is always one. For the sign module, the character is one for even elements. So it's on the conjugacy class E and on the conjugacy class consisting of ST and TS. And the character of the sign module is minus one for the odd elements. So this is a conjugacy class consisting of S, T, and W0. And the third row is the character of S2,1. So it's a two-dimensional module. So the value of the character at E is two. So on the element S, S is a transposition of one and two. It has one fixed point. So we take the number of fixed points and subtract one. The outcome is zero. And the element ST, it's a long cycle. It cyclically permutes the elements one, two, and three in one of the directions. This doesn't have any fixed points at all. So the number of fixed points is zero and minus one, we get minus one. So the value is minus one. So this is the character table of S3. Let us now compute the character table of the dihedral group D two times four. So this will take some time because we actually, in order to do this, we actually need to classify simple modules over this group. So recall that this group is a group of linear symmetries of the square inscribed in the unit circle in R2 such that one of the vertices of the square coincides with the point 1, 0. So these are linear symmetries of this picture. We have the following generating elements of this group. So one trivial symmetry is we can rotate the whole picture by 90 degrees counterclockwise. Let us denote this element by R. Another obvious symmetry is a reflection with respect to the horizontal line. Let us denote this element by S. So if we take these two elements at the generators, then the dihedral group D2 times 4 consists of the elements E, R, R square, R cube, S, R S, R square S, and R cube S. So it has eight elements. 2 times 4 is equal to 8. It will be more convenient for the description of simple modules to have a slightly different presentation of this dihedral group. Let us consider the following picture. Consider the diagonal line L. And then we have the obvious symmetry of the square given by reflection with respect to this line. So the, we take this line as a mirror, and the mirror reflection in this line gives us a symmetry of this picture. So let's denote the symmetry by T. Then the elements S and T generate the dihedral group, and now we can write the whole dihedral group as the collection of the following elements. E, S, T, ST, TS, STS, TST, and the element W0, which is equal to STST and TSTS. So the defining relations of the dihedral group with respect to the generators S and T are as follows. S square and T square is equal to the identity and STST is equal to TSTS. So in these generators S and T, the element R, our rotation, is equal to the product of T and S. So now we can try to classify simple modules over D2 times 4. So we already know the following simple modules. Of course, we always have the trivial simple module. 
But we also know that the defining representation of any dihedral group is simple. So we have the defining module, let's call it capital N. So what are we missing? Or are we missing anything at all? So we know that the cardinality of the group equals the sum of squares of dimensions of simple modules. For the dihedral group D2 times 4, this gives us the following equation. 8, this is the cardinality of the group, is equal to 2 squared, this is square of the dimension of n, plus 1 squared, this is the square of the dimension of the trivial module, plus something else. What can be here in this something else? So, so far we have only 5, so we need 3 here. And the only way to write 3 as a sum of the squares of positive integers is actually as 1 square plus 1 square plus 1 square. So what we are really missing are the three one-dimensional simple modules. So these three one-dimensional simple modules are quite easy to determine. So each element of a one-dimensional module is an eigenvector for any element in the group. So let A be the eigenvalue of S and let B be the eigenvalue of T. So these numbers A and B should satisfy the following equations. So A squared should be equal to one, this is because E square is the identity. B square should be equal to 1, since T square is the identity. And then we have the property that ABAB should be equal to BABA, and this is because STST is equal to TSTS. But now A and B are just numbers, so ABAB is equal to BABA. This is equivalent to saying that A square B is equal to A square B. So this is simply redundant. This equation doesn't play any role. So the only equations which we need to satisfy are a square is equal to 1 and b square is equal to 1. And this has exactly four solutions. a and b can be any of the numbers plus or minus 1. Solution number 1, if a and b are equal to 1, this gives exactly the trivial module. So if a and b are both equal to minus 1, so this gives us the sine module, so the elements s and t act as minus 1, so this is a sine module. But we also have two mixed sine modules, so if a is equal to 1 and b is equal to minus 1, so this is a mixed sine module, sum one of s and t acts as 1 and another one is minus 1. Let's denote this mixed sine module by c plus minus. And similarly, we have the mixed sine module C minus plus, where A acts as minus 1 and B acts as 1. Let us now determine the conjugacy classes in D2 times 4. The first conjugacy class is the identity. The identity is always a conjugacy class. So the claim is that the second conjugacy class consists of S and TST. So let's start with S. So if you conjugate S by S, nothing happens. So we can conjugate by T, and then we get TST. And, and now, of course, conjugating by T goes back to S. Not interesting, so let's conjugate by S again. And this gives us ST, STS. So here we have ST, ST, which we can rewrite as TSTS, and here S squared is equal to 1. So this gives us TST. So we cannot get anything new. So S and TST form a conjugacy class. And similarly, using the symmetries that S and T can be swapped. So the defining relations for S and T are symmetric with respect to their swap. So the third conjugacy class will consist of T and STS. And then we have the fourth conjugacy class consisting of ST and TS. Indeed, we start with S team, and conjugating by either S or T gives TS, and then we go back. So ST and TS form a conjugacy class on their own. And we have the fifth conjugacy class consisting of the longest element W0. So the element W0 can be written both as STST and as TSTS. So this is the only element left in the group, so it also should be a conjugacy class. So we have five conjugacy classes. So let's now determine the characters of all those modules. So let us recall the following things. 
So the character of the one-dimensional module coincides with the module. The character of the regular module is zero everywhere, apart from the identity where it is the cardinality of G. And we also know that each simple module appears in the regular module with the multiplicity equal to its dimension. So in order to compute the character of the two-dimensional simple module N, we can take the character of the regular module, subtract the characters of all one-dimensional modules, which are easy, they're described directly by the module structure, and then we need to divide the outcome by two because N appears in the regular module with multiplicity two. So let us now look at the partial answer, which will also include the character of the regular module so that we can compute the character of the defining representation N. So we have four one-dimensional modules, the trivial one, the sine, and the two mixed sine modules, minus plus and plus minus. The character of the trivial module is a constant function which has value 1. The character of the sine module is 1 at the even elements E, S, T, T, S, and W0, and is minus 1 at the odd elements S, T, S, T, T, and S, T, S. The character of the mixed sine module C minus plus so it is 1 at the identity, it's minus 1 at S by definition, and it's plus 1 at T by definition. Then it's minus 1 at ST because it's just a product of minus 1 and 1. But it will be 1 at W0 because it contains C twice. Similarly, the character of the mixed sign module C plus minus is 1 at the identity, 1 at S by definition, minus 1 at T minus 1 at st, and 1 at w0. And the character of the regular module is 8 at e, and 0 everywhere else. So if we take one half of the character of the regular module minus the characters of, of all these one-dimensional modules, what we will get is that the character of the natural module is equal to 2 at the identity, right? So 8 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 divided by 2 is 2. So 0 minus 1 plus 1 plus 1 minus 1 is 0. Divided by 2 is 0. Similarly, we get 0 here and here. So here we get 0 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 divided by 2. It is minus 2. So the character of the defining module n is 2, 0, 0, 0, minus 2. So here is a sanity check. The matrix of S acting on N, S was reflection in the horizontal line. So it sends the first basis vector to itself and the second basis vector to minus itself. So it's a diagonal matrix with 1 and minus 1 on the diagonal and its trace is 0. Sanity check 2, the matrix of the rotation, its rotation by 90 degrees, uh, in the standard basis acting on n is as follows. So rotating, we send first basis vector to the second one, and the second basis vector to minus the first one. So the diagonal elements are zero, so the trace is zero. So the value of this character here at st also should be equal to zero. So the full answer is as follows. So the characters of the one-dimensional modules we have already seen. And the character of n is 2, 0, 0, 0, minus 2. So this is the character table for the dihedral group D 2 times 4. So let us end with some problems and questions. Question 1. Check with all details that the class functions form a subspace of the space of all functions and show that the dimension of the subspace coincides with the number of conjugacy classes in G. Question 2. Compute the character table of the group Z2 times Z2. Question 3. Check that the characters of simple modules in all character tables presented during the lecture are linearly independent as elements in the space of class functions. Question 4. Use the character table for S3, which we computed, 
to compute the character for the tensor product of the natural S3 module with itself in two different ways. First, using the formula for the character of the tensor product, and then using the decomposition of the tensor product into simples, which we obtained in the previous lecture, and then compare the two outcomes. Question five, compute the determinant of the character table for the group of residues modulo k, where k is greater than or equal to one. Thank you very much and see you next time.